It's a pleasure to welcome you to the first dinner of the new year. And in doing so, I want to put a question to all of you. I think we can all agree that a corporation has a duty to maximize returns for their shareholders. But, it, but does a corporation also have a duty to society? That is a question that is at the heart of a letter our speaker recently sent to all of the major CEOs in the United States and others around the globe. In the letter, he says that the public expectations of your company have never been greater. He closes with a, with a subtle but unmistakable warning to hold them accountable for not only doing well, but also doing good. Now, not everyone can credibly make the threat, but our speaker tonight is Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, which is the largest financial asset manager in the world with $6 trillion in assets under management. Now, I want that to really sink in. $6 trillion. That's considerably larger than the proposed federal budget the president just released today. It's more than the entire gross domestic product of Japan, which is the fourth largest economy in the world. Now, because of its size, BlackRock has been called the Amazon of Wall Street. But you see, I'm in the same business as Larry, a little bit smaller, but in the same business. And I think of Amazon as the BlackRock of retailing. Now, we don't want to say that to Jeff Bezos because we all really want Amazon to come to Chicago, right? Larry grew up in California, where his mother taught college and his father owned a shoe store. He attended UCLA for both undergraduate and graduate school, earning an MBA in real estate before beginning his storied career at First Boston, which I learned today he was in the class behind both at graduate school and the first class of his career at First Boston behind Bob Murley, who's on our dais. Interesting coincidence. At First Boston, he was a pioneer in developing an obscure financial product that was pretty much under the public radar until we had a little event called the Great Recession. I'm, of course, talking about mortgage-backed securities. While still in his 20s, Larry made a lot of money for First Boston and was even being talked about as the future CEO of the company. But then he suddenly lost some money. In the scheme of things, not a lot, maybe $100 million, but it was enough to turn him from, in his own words, a star to a jerk. He and First Boston parted ways, and that led to a partnership with the Blackstone Group. Another tense battle ultimately ensued, there's a story, and the creation of BlackRock happened in 1994. He's building that been building that company at an amazing rate ever since, staggering rate. His open secret to success is a massive computerized system called Aladdin, which can instantly monitor millions of trades and analyze outcomes for millions of portfolios based on even slight shifts in the economy. Among other things, this gave him a lot of insight into what went wrong during the financial crisis. And as an expert on mortgage-backed securities, he was called in to help and to clean up. With people like Hank Paulson and Jamie Dimon and Tim Geithner on speed dial, Larry Fink helped engineer a remarkable rescue for the financial industry. And that is not an overstatement in any way. I read a note that said there was a day in which uh, Geithner called him 21 times in a day. Larry is here tonight at an unusual moment in history for money managers. We all know the stock market has more than tripled in the last 10 years, an astonishing bull by any measure, even if it's been a little bit volatile lately, which we'll talk about. BlackRock has made a lot of money for a lot of people, but in a recent appearance in Davos, Larry raised a concern that too many people have missed the party, keeping most of their retirement savings in low-interest bank accounts out of fear for the future. He said, we are not addressing the issue of inclusion, and he challenged his fellow business leaders to help quell those fears. Part of Larry's answer has been at the center of my work for years, and that is financial literacy. Too many people in our country, he says, and in the world simply do not understand investing, compounding, saving. These are very important issues, and they don't have confidence to participate. Larry has also spoken about the responsibility of business leaders. 
the responsibility business leaders have to encourage long-term thinking in the public sector. For example, he sees a real threat in neglecting infra infrastructure that could limit economic growth by, and here's that word again, trillions. I don't get to use trillions a lot in speeches, so I'm really making the most of it. These days, there are so many important questions, not just for governments, but also for companies seeking to locate, invest, and expand. So it will be good to hear from Larry about how the business sector can help meet these challenges, reduce fear, and extend prosperity to more of our fellow Americans and to people around the world. So it is with my great pleasure that I invite Larry Fink to join us for a discussion. I have to tell you how hard he is to get. Everyone works on Larry Fink. Everyone wants him to speak. And I happen to be at a speech where he was after me, and I quartered him in the green room, and I begged him to come. And I also said that not only will I not accept no, I'm asking you to call your assistant right now and put the date on your calendar. And, and I he did. actually did it. <clears throat> I did. In the backstage of the Deal Book Conference. <laughs> and that brings us here tonight. So, Larry, I, you know this, and we talked about it. I've read everything I could read um, about you and about the company. And one of the things that I think is just not a story that's very well told or really understood is the remarkable story of entrepreneurship that is your company. That you went from zero, zero mm -hmm. dollars under management to $6 trillion basically in three decades. We'll have our 30th anniversary in two weeks, yes. So 30 years old, wow. zero to $6 trillion. You told me your compound, compounded return for your stock is in the high 20s mm -hmm. since your inception. So this is a stunning story. <coughs> what do you think really drove your success? If you could put pinpoint what made this work in such a stunning way, what was it? Well, let me just say first, thank to Chicago Economic Club. It's, it's a real honor to be here. And I don't have any idea what we're going to talk about because that introduction was so nice, Melody. So thank you very much. <laughs> and so um, I've been thinking about what made us successful over the last 30 years. We actually had a town hall yesterday um, to talk about BlackRock's purpose for the next 30 years to all our employees. And I would say probably the most important thing that we did from the first day we started the organization was we, we framed every question, we framed everything that we were doing on behalf of what the client needs. And that sounds kind of hokey and phony, but everything in terms of our acquisitions or mergers, the way we framed the company, the way we designed our technology, it was all done in the framework of what does the client need. And in addition, I, I must say now in 30 years, I mean, this is a probably the most amazing feat that I could talk about in, in my career that in th these last 30 years, I never looked backwards. The trust that we have with our partners, uh, the organization, the spirit of the firm, and the culture of the organization to try to constantly uh, improve, grow, stay in front of the needs of the clients, uh, focus on the totality of the firm, not any silos. Um, after 30 years, I could proudly say um, we've been focused forward every day for 30 years. We're pretty close to 30 years. And, and I believe that relentless focus on the client and the client needs, trying to anticipate what the client needs, um, has given us the ability to build I would say, as deeper relationships in our business with, uh, with our clients worldwide than any other firm. We're not, in, we're not a product pusher. We're talking about outcomes. We're talking about solutions. We focus on the client's needs, whatever it's their liability, what their focus is, what they're trying to do. And more importantly, at BlackRock, we never talk about $6 trillion, by the way, because it's a meaningless statistic. We actually focus on what is the need of every one of our clients. And we have to serve that client who has $1,000 with us as much as that, that you know, couple defined contribution plans we manage over $300 billion for. One very big one in this country. Um, one client. Now it's for a lot of individuals, uh, but if we treat that one client who has $1,000 with us or, or that very large client any differently, then we're not serving that client. 
And so the key is making sure that you're serving the client as obviously as best you can. You're trying to deliver a solution. You're trying to work for that organization or for that individual. And you're trying to have them focus on the large, long outcome. I get that when you have 100, 200, 300 people, mm. 1,000. Mm. When you have 13,000 in 100 countries that right. speak 100 languages, yeah. how do you train that? Because people are, they, they are, yes, they, I think they, they inherently want to do the right thing, but they are also thinking about their own futures and their sure. own outcomes and their own paychecks and how they can maximize their own, it you gets, know. Well, it gets back to my letter, I mean, at BlackRock. If employees believe in the purpose of an organization, if they believe in our mission, and I do believe our 13,800 employees today, by and large, believe in the mission. Um, so to achieve what we're trying to do is, it's about talking about culture every day. There's not a day in my job there's not a business trip where I visit where I don't focus on culture. And, and all the other leaders do that. And we obviously try to live that culture that we talk about. So we, it's not some BS conversation that's etched on a wall. It is, it's how we live every day. But probably the key characteristic to be in 100 countries, that means in Japan, and we're the largest pension manager in Japan, we have to be Japanese. We're not a U.S. firm in Japan. We're a Japanese firm. Now, the principles of the organization, are, the spirit of the organization, um, we have to, everybody in Japan has to feel that, understand it. They have to understand what are the proper behaviors and what are not the proper behaviors, how to deal with the client. Uh, relentless focus on education and re-education and staying in front of all the needs of the clients. In Italy, we have to be Italian. In the, in the U.S., we have to be American. In Mexico, where we are now becoming, we just did an acquisition, we're going to be the largest asset manager in Mexico. We have to be Mexican. We have to be connected with society. We have to work with society to build a better future for our clients in Mexico. And if we try to, do, try to impart a, an American ideal in Mexico, we're not serving our clients in Mexico. And, but probably the most important thing, you mentioned Aladdin, What's so important about Aladdin for us was we have one technology pipe worldwide that connects everything we do at the firm. So when you think about firms and how they grew, and especially if they did acquisitions, they bolted on technology. And they really did not have a good connectivity within the, within the organization as the organization grew. Every time we did an acquisition within a, a period of a few years or shorter, every component of that firm that was acquired, it wasn't bolted on, it was, it was, it became part of BlackRock. Integrated. And everything from client connectivity to all risk management worldwide is under one common platform. Having one singular pipe, 100 countries worldwide, it allows, and if everybody believing in having one pipe, and that's important, that everybody culturally believes that we have one connective tissue that's connecting the whole organization and information, that actually builds culture too. And people believe in that. And so it, by having one connective pipe, it actually breaks down silos because the information is all fluid. And, and, and so I would say what, was so, what made us what we are today is the resiliency of our technology, but more importantly, the steadfast view that we could only have one pipe. And when we acquired Malim in 2006, we were surprised that it had 18 operating platforms. And, and that's one, Merrill Lynch Investment Management. Yeah. And uh, it, it took some time. And then we acquired in 2009 uh, BGI, um, and it was considered one of the preeminent investment firms. iShares was a part of that. It had over 100 different technology platforms because every little business had its own little silo and technology and they didn't connect. Um, and that took a, that's why it took a little longer than two years to get it all connected onto one common platform. But I can't underscore enough by, being, um, by insisting on one platform 
one connective tissue it really does allow us then to speak the talk that we're trying to create that culture and then understanding worldwide and uh, and I think you know I'm not here to tell you we're perfect I'm not here to tell you we don't screw up and but having one pipe allow us to be better connected than most firms. So it sounds like technology ended up being a real driver of this six trillion dollars. It was one of them. Melody, we would, n we would not even be who we are today if it wasn't for the technology. I read something from one of your former partners at First Boston that said, this is a guy who always wanted more than he had. He was the guy whose nose was pressed against the window. He, you could sense his ambition. What was driving you this whole time? Because you were, you got big pretty fast. I mean, um, after, I, I hear you're not saying that you talk about $6 trillion, but it's there. And but it's, it's not it, a, me, but it's not a, it, it's really an unimportant statistic. It really is. It's a big number, but it's not something we should be focused on. If you were on. suddenly three, I think it would bug you. <laughs> you're right. You're right. We got to constantly grow and evolve. We got to stay in front of the needs of our clients. If we stay in front of the needs of our clients, we execute on behalf of our clients. If we help our clients, and I think we are one of the great, I mean, I, I got to step back for a second. When we bought BGI in 2009, first of all, we lost $150 billion in assets from clients. They were so pissed off at us. And people, clients said we weren't focused on Were them. you worried about that decision we when actually, that happened? We actually budgeted that. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it came true. Um, I would say eight out of 10 commentaries then said it was a stupid merger. Um, a stupid merger primarily because you can't marry active and passive. Which I want to talk about. Okay, but, but a, that's a rich subject. Okay, well, good. Um, the reality is our clients have active and passive. They have, and it was my belief that focusing on the client, if clients have both products, we could actually deliver comprehensively both products. And Vanguard deliver, had done that. Well, they're not as much an active, uh, you know, so they're much more passive. And it actually became true. Clients have looked to us to provide them with a, with a comprehensive outcome-oriented type of relationship, building with them. Many of our clients are here, and we have those type of relationships. Where but I, I want to get back to, and I get the client Oh, you're getting back to, to my ambition now? Yeah, oh. I want to get back to your ambition. I want to understand, <laughs> because uh, most people at some point would feel pretty su satisfied in the accomplishment, and I don't get a sense that there's any easing up there is, in no. terms of your... So I'm more, what is it, then, that you wake up with the desire to fulfill? I mean, is it, to, you uh, say it's 10 trillion, or is no, it? No, there's actually no number. I have a desire to improve every day. That's what. Just, it's a personal thing. Yeah, to drive and improve and try to grow and learn. How every do you day. measure if you, or know if you're improving? You know, you know it. It's like, you know, you look at yourself, you know, you look at yourself in the mirror, you know if you're fat or not. So, you know, you look at yourself, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, you, you, you can look in the mirror. Some people know that but keep eating. <laughs> so, I mean, how do you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's true. Uh, I, I, I have a, a, a drive um, that is pretty intense to, to try to believe that I'm self-improving every day. Do you wear people out? Uh, where's my chief of staff? <laughs> there are. <laughs> Do I wear people out? In a good way. In a good way. <laughs> good answer. That was politically correct. <laughs> She's clearly very smart. <laughs> yes, she is. Uh, no, I, um, I, I think people, you know, I, uh, I think I help drive many of my leaders and the next generation of leaders to be driving themselves. I think I have been a great role model um, for so many of the next generation of leaders of the firm. And I don't have to tell them to drive. They're driving just as fast as me. They're working just as hard for the improvement of the organization every day. Uh, I actually believe that is one of the great, and that's one of the fun things for me to see, watching these young people now, you know, adults and, and serious leaders of the firm today, 
watching them drive their careers, drive themselves, succeed and build. And now they're driving their people too in, in, a, in a way um, that I think we're all proud of what we're accomplishing. But I would say today, despite our size, I see more opportunity today for BlackRock than I saw 10 years ago. So let me ask you a question, and I don't mean this to be... Um, oh, be whatever. <laughs> anything untoward. Steve Jobs was fired. Yeah. Jeffrey oh. Katzenberg was fired. Yeah. And you were fired. Yeah. Well, I wasn't fired, but I, was, I quit before I was near fired. <laughs> <laughs> if you had stayed, you wouldn't have had the job. Yeah, but I, no, I quit. Uh, <laughs> no, but there's a different story. I knew, I knew, for a, you know, the, the $100 million event happened in 80, 86, and I left in 88. Okay, okay so I stayed around, yeah. but I knew I was leaving at that moment, the way how the firm. Did that drive some of this too? I was so angry at myself. Now it drove. You were angry with yourself. I was just mortified at myself because, and this is one of the experiences, I talk about this experience all the time because, um, let's be clear, the failure wasn't anybody else's but mine. So you owned it? I totally owned it. Uh, and, I, and the firm wanted to fire a bunch of people for that loss, and I told the firm, you need to fire me then, and then if you're gonna fire them, fire me, and they wouldn't do it, so everybody stayed, by the way. Um, but I did believe that because I was ultimately responsible for that position. I mean, and, but the, probably the most important thing I learned and this is one of the great lessons we learned and one of the foundations of our risk management system. We should have been fired a year ago and a quarter ago before the loss. We were making so much money and we had no idea why we were making so much money. We had just extraordinary risk. And we were, you know, and there was no risk systems then. And nobody bothered to ask us, how are you making so much money? Or, or I never asked they myself. They were just happy with the money. Yes. I and, uh, and I never forgave myself. And that was, that's a key element that drove and me. And were you not forgiving yourself for not understanding the risk yes. at that point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, it, was under, it was ultimately my responsibility. Um, and the firm gave me a lot of responsibility at a very young age. And for many years, I achieved what they asked me to do. And then I did it. Um, but it took me a year and a half to try to search what I wanted to do. And it was very clear during that year and a half, not only did we not understand the risk, there were so many other companies that really didn't understand the risk. And most importantly, the buy side, the investors had no idea the risk they were taking. And there was a great need for a company that starts off uh, with a high concentration in risk analytics and, and principally in the fixed income area. Then There was a lot of analytics and equities back then, but nothing in, in, in bonds. And, um, and so it took, us, it took me a year and a half to assemble my thoughts and, and, I, and I, told it, I told the story to uh, Steve Schwartz and Pete Peterson and uh, they loved it and they, they had more confidence in me than I had myself. They wanted to go right ahead and we did that and it all, you know, we started the making, we actually started making money in, within two weeks. I mean, the outpouring of our, of, the, of, of competitors, friends, clients that I had for my years at First Boston all came and it all worked. So I want to talk about the letter because there's a lot there. You write. Yeah. And when you write, I read uh, someone said you're a modern day E.F. Hutton. People listen. Oh, okay. You get a lot of press about your letters, <clears throat> a lot. And they are provocative. And this most recent one about the duty of a company to society has gotten a lot of attention. Um, you believe a company should be run to the benefit of all stakeholders, not just shareholders. So is that is, a fair? <clears throat> well, let me put it in the context. Everything's done in a context. And everybody compares that letter to Milton Friedman, and they don't talk about the context when he wrote that. So I could, I could talk about that too. But this is the fifth letter. I've done these for five years. Um, and the context was, we, as I said, in 2009, we bought BGI, which was the largest indexer. You know, it was iShares. And, and, and over the time that we took ownership, ETS started to, to really grow dramatically. Um, when we bought BGI, iShares were 340 billion. 
and now it's 1.8 trillion. So to give you an example of the growth of that one sector. Um, and so um, it, it actually took me a few years to really understand what, what indexing is about and what are the responsibilities. And I'm ashamed it took me three years to really come to grips with what it was. But way back, you know, seven, eight years ago, people called index money dumb money. Uh, they, they, you know, they're just passive, they don't do anything. Well, if you're focusing on the needs of the clients and the investors who are trying to earn a long-term return, um, you do have responsibilities, even as an ind indexer. In active management, as you know, if you hate a company, you could sell the company. Right. You don't have to own the stock. We have no choice but to own a company. We have to own these companies forever as long as they're an index. And that means we own a lot of bad companies. Because an index is a bunch of good companies and bad companies, and that's what an index is. <clears throat> and then, obviously, over the last five to seven years, the, the tremendous success of some of the activists and some of the positives and negative effects that they're having. But <clears throat> in many cases, we were watching activists buy companies or buy, uh, threaten a company. To, uh, companies made some changes. Stock royalties, 30%. The activist sells. And we're holding the bag of the index or owning the company forever and ever. And the company could be impeded, let's say, by excess debt because they bought back too many shares. Or they did something strategically that was probably good in the short run, but impeded the company in the future. So <clears throat> all these experiences gave me this view that, you know, we have to be louder, we have to be involved. So over the last five years, we built up our, our corporate stewardship team. And then through the years, I've been writing these letters saying we have to focus on the long term. We're the ultimate long term investor. What is long term <clears throat> in your view? It, well, long term is not defined by my view, is defined by each company and their industry they're in. So for a great Chicago company like Boeing, long term is 10 plus years. That's the cycle for airplanes. Um, so long term has to be associated with the business each company's in okay. and their product cycle. You know, pharma, what is long term? I don't know, it's probably more than 10 years. Is it 12 years, is it 14 years? You tell me how long product cycles last and with, uh, and, and, and with product development. So <clears throat> every industry should identify and every company should identify that what, their, what long term is. But clearly long term is more than a few years. And depending on the industry and the cycle of, an, of a company, long term is really a, is connected to a company and the company's strength. So we own these companies forever. We can't sell the shares. The only power an indexer has the power of their vote. And so over the years, we started um, building out our team. We have the largest corporate stewardship team, which is still very small, 35 people. Uh, we've committed now to have it 70. So giving you the context for, for this year's letter. Um, <clears throat> and then last year, and I repeated it this year, because I saw too much evidence where management, um, and there were management changes, uh, maybe at the CEO level or president level, and I didn't see any changes at the board level. And I actually believe there was less accountability at boards than there should have been in, a, in global companies. And so uh, we've now been asking companies, please describe your long-term plan. You tell us what long-term is. But most importantly, please just tell us that you reviewed your long-term strategy with your board. That's a little simple thing, but, but we've, there was just not enough accountability. So if there is a problem, and a problem with management team, well, why isn't there questions about that board, too? The board's responsible for accepting that strategy. And in some of the European companies where there's a separation of chairman and, 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 and CEO, where there was changes of CEOs, they bring in a new CEO and they turn their strategy 90 degrees and the chairman's still there. Okay, that's just unacceptable. So I'm just trying to give you the, the backdrop. <clears throat> and then um, watching the changes in this country, understanding how um, how I would say, as a lifelong Democrat, how I think Democrats lost the voice of the families who were left behind by globalization. 
And I think President Trump had a better ear than certainly I did in understanding that, that, that issue and, and certainly a better ear than many of the Democrats. And there is a greater need to do more. And I know under the fiduciary standard rule in the United States for the Department of Labor, the only requirement of a pension fund is to maximize return. So we live on that. So then I, in this year's letter, which you now, I'm trying to get to your answer, <clears throat> over a long horizon, I believe a company to have strong financial performance, still the number one paramount requirement. A company has to have a purpose and a purpose that connects its employees, a purpose that connects its clients to the company. And so a company can have a long but I don't I financial performance. Let me add one more thing. And in addition, clients, com companies need to be more connected in the societies where they operate and be part of that. And I think we've lost that. I think we've, we've misused and overused this concept. The only responsibility is profits, profits, profits. Because I do believe when you're connected with your clients, when you're connected with your community over a long horizon, you will produce those, uh, those above trend line profits. When you're not connected, when you're disassociated, if you have a purpose that does not connect your employees, if you have a purpose that does not connect your clients or the communities in which you operate over a long horizon, you're gonna fail. Do you think that some people misunderstood your intent? Because to hear you say this is very different than how some of the, the response came back at you. And I mean, I'll just quote an exact line from your letter. Every company must deliver not only financial performance, but also show it makes a positive contribution to society. Correct. So I think a lot of companies would say, they could say that they are connected to their community by saying, I have, you have companies that have hundreds of thousands of employees. And because I have hundreds of thousands of employees, I'm therefore connect, connected to society. I think you are suggesting I'm, more I'm suggesting than more. That. Because and you say the role of a company has never been greater. Well, I, I, I inferred by, I think, governments, and I'm saying plural, not singular in this moment. Yes. Governments have, more, have unfortunately been more focused in the short term. So you and feel that I the believe, I believe companies can and must play a bigger role. And I believe the best companies and the most, the companies that perform the best, I'm talking about financially, are companies that are thinking beyond uh, that profit of the moment, but they're, but they're being more, they, they are more connected with the society in which you're operating. They're serving a purpose. And when, it, when, when that company is that connected with, its, with the society in which they operate, beyond just having employment, but serving a, a bigger role in the community, they will have so give examples. long term. They will have long term financial success. So is that philanthropy? Is that benefits? Is that it, it, what well, is what is that? It's it's education. It, it, yes, yes, and yes. It depends it's, on the need of the client of the company, the role the company plays. We're not saying if you're in hydrocarbons, get out of it. Okay, we're not saying that, and, and, but we have, you know, we've been much more um, impactful, I believe, with many of the companies that are in the energy area to start focusing on their impact on, on, on climate change and how are they navigating uh, their company. The last thing we wanna know as a long-term investor that they're gonna ultimately have a lot of stranded costs or stranded businesses, in, uh, and so, Probably the most important thing that we are trying to do with, and what we're trying to ask everybody is to trust your shareholders. Be more, in, be more um, transparent in your strategy. Help us understand your purpose and how you see 
what's right for you and your company and your role in your society. We're not telling you what you should do. Should it be in education or philanthropy? What we're asking companies to think about their higher purpose. And we want them to be more open about how they are trying to And improve. a purpose is not selling more things. No, that's an outcome. That's an outcome. So if you are selling soap, your purpose is to have cleaner bodies. Clean? Okay. <clears throat> and the outcome BlackRock's, is that I'm selling you soap. Our, to our purpose has been at BlackRock for the last 30 year, years has been to try to improve the financial well-being of our clients worldwide. So let's say that in terms of the, I hear you, I understand it. You're an indexer. No. As well as an active manager, 1. 8, I was just going to say, 1.8 1. 1. trillion, trillion in active. active. You yeah. own thousands of companies. Yeah. When do you vote against them then? Because I read in proxy voting, 91%. Right, 91% of the time you're voting with Pretty, management. And I'm proud of it. So the vast majority of the time you're voting with? No. So one of the things that I've asked in the letter, and, we've, and, and there have been many changes, what we're asking loudly in every letter be engaged, talk to us the whole time. And we are, we've had, there's not a day that doesn't bond, where we don't have many companies in our offices worldwide engaged with us talking about what they're trying to do, their strategy. They're, if they have an issue related to where they think they're gonna need a vote in the proxy. Have you established the non-starters? We just will not vote for this. Well, I'm, we have a or team that's a company, doing it. Yes. Um, or is I don't nothing know if there, I don't, black I don't, and white? I don't know if there's any non-starters, so I'm not aware of that, but okay. we have a whole independent team. I'm not involved in any singular vote. Uh, I, I'm part of a policy committee where we set up the policies they execute, uh, but I'm not involved in anything. So when a CEO comes in and wants to see me and lo uh, lobby me for how we're going to vote, I have my proxy team there. So can you give an example of any companies, and maybe you don't want to do this, so I don't want to put you on the spot, that you think this is what I'm talking about. This is no, I, profit I don't want to put and social. But I would say um, uh, Chevron is a very good example where uh, a few years ago we voted against them and in, in, in how they're positioning their organization. And um, uh, John Watson came in many times. He's, he's stepped on as CEO now. Uh, but over that year, to hear what we had to do, we worked with them, we were engaged with them, and we voted with them last year. Uh, and we believe their disclosure was appropriate. Uh, it was very public. We uh, and we we did not vote alongside Exxon. And I'm proud to say we've had many dialogues with Darren Wood and his board subsequently since then. And I, I have no idea what's going to happen because I'm not right. part of that. But I but we have engaged dialogue. So the reason why I'm proud of 91, we're not here to be a police against these organizations. We want companies to improve. And the best way we believe we can help companies improve is by being engaged out of the news, quietly, privately, working with them, not, and that's what we do. And, you know, and so, so you're not an activist in that regard. I think we're, we, we are becoming a more active, inclusive shareholder. We're not an activist. That is not what we want. We have voted, last year we voted 38% of the time with activists. So some of them actually have good policies. Some of them we believe probably are pushing companies that need to be pushed. And other times, uh, well, the majority of the times we vote against them. But we're not. One of the areas that I read that you do spend a lot of time on is you talked about boards, diversity. These are issues that you say are important to you, near and dear to me, this issue of diversity. Why are you focused there? Well, that's just one component of good governance. Um, Why don't people do that better? I don't have any idea. I mean, it shocks to me. First of all, when we talk about diversity, one thing that is underspoken, it's very, very clear, I think more and more companies are focusing on gender diversity, still not enough. Everybody's focusing on ethnic diversity. What is not being discussed enough because it's an intangible and it's harder to, if you don't get diversity of mind, you're probably in as much trouble as any component of diversity. I actually believe too many business people, probably academics and on and on and on and any other profession, docs and everybody else, 
They like replicants around them. They like people who think, act, do exactly what they do. And that's the ultimate failure of any organization. Now, you generally get diversity of mind through gender, through you know, ethnic backgrounds, race. But, I mean, the one thing that I'm really rigorous on now, I make sure that now, you know, we hire 450 young people every year. It, you know, I'm trying to get away from Ivy Leagues. I'm trying to get to more state schools. I am trying to really make sure that we get, you know, people from different backgrounds, different things. And ultimately, the most important thing, uh, you know, I know we don't do this, but if I, if I was king, I would never hire a business major undergraduate. <laughs> I would never hire a business major. Because, because they're trained to think alike. No, because anybody who's getting a business degree as an undergraduate, and I'll tell you why I'm wrong in this, but my um, who get a business degree as an undergraduate, that means they're focused on money, not focusing on learning. I believe the MBA plays a good role after you had a purposeful undergraduate degree to teach you how to think and act. Now, there are many young people who they may be first generation uh, uh, college educated, and they believe the best way to get a great job to be better than their parents is through a business degree. So. Um, what was your undergraduate degree in? It was political theory. So anything but business, you say? For uh, yeah, theory. anything but business. Uh, you can be in a, a, economics. I mean, but come on, please. Taking accounting 101 as an undergraduate, please. S excuse me. But <laughs> okay. you think that uh, that's my, con you know, we all have conscious biases. Right. This is one of my conscious biases. <laughs> that's all. At least you're aware. Yeah, that's what I said. I'm aware that's of it. That's very helpful. Yeah, yeah. It would be worse if it was an unconscious bias and I did all that. You know, that would when be When you talk worse. to your peers about this issue, do you think that this resonates? Because you talk about the energy around it, but the actual numbers don't move a lot. The no, but, I, but, I, but no, first of all, I mean, I can speak about our firm. Uh, Ten years ago, we were not that focused on it. We screwed up. We're actually terrible today as a firm at having women in our investors groups. Okay, we are focused now, it's gonna be a 10 year venture, of building from the bottom up young women as investors. Instead. You have to be purposeful. We now at BlackRock make um, the diversity of every business a component of the leader's comp. Were people okay with that? They had no choice. <laughs> but we are seeing real behavior change, it works. Okay. You get what you insist. You have to be, sometimes you just gotta be blunt. And I don't believe that people were consciously biased. I do believe people recruit like types of people. Right. I mean, I, I actually believe people have these unconscious, I think, you know, when we do all these unconscious uh, uh, bias trainings at BlackRock, and we find women are just as biased at times uh, against women as men. So these unconscious biases are terrible that we all possess. And the key is learning about your unconscious biases. And, and so um, you need sometimes blunt instruments to change behaviors. And you're not afraid to be a blunt instrument, clearly. Well, COP is a great blunt instrument. Yeah. But you'll use whatever instrument you need to use. I mean, a lot of people won't do so that. So the, the dilemma I have as a CEO in writing this letter, if we don't if we don't live right. the life of what I'm asking everybody to do, we are going to be, yeah. you know, we'll be a great target. It will be right. so easy. It is just like so visible. Um, and so I will tell you, even when we, when I write this letter and it takes months to do, I, you know, constantly check with HR, are we doing this, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But does it sharpen up the purpose yeah. by doing it oh, that way, absolutely. putting it out there and Melody, making it's, it? it? But also, before this letter is sent out, my entire leadership team reviews it. My board reviews it before it goes out. So for Bitsio, we have a common um, uh, friend. Uh, he reads it and reviews it. And everybody has the ability to give me their opinion. Does, do the opinions matter? Most of the time. I love the fact that you're honest about the well, answer. Well, I don't have to agree with everybody's opinion, but I'd like to hear it. Okay. And it's a letter's on my name, so it has to be what I believe. But it represents but it, an institution. 
and represent the And you've the got to be able to deliver. Yeah. And so, no, I want everybody's input. And, I'm, I, you know, and everybody knows but that, you know, you're going to be listened to. I may not change. And that's okay. But I'm, I, I welcome everybody's opinion. I want to pivot to two important subjects okay, that are please. super important. Okay. One, you say that there's a retirement crisis in this country. What there, can we do about it? Talk about it. Um, but talking is, how do we become financially No, but financially we don't talk about literate? it. Congress doesn't care about it. Um, it's, so well, let me step back for a second. We have a retirement problem worldwide. In China, the average Chinese today saves 45% of disposable income. Can you imagine a Chinese economy if they only save 30% how strong it would be? The reason why they save, there's no safety right, nets for nothing. retirement, no safety nets for health care. One child family, the rising middle class couple, they're saving now for their parents' retirement because they don't have enough. So the savings is incredible. In Europe, 80 plus percent of all personal savings is in a bank account. So we're seeing the fear of the future in so many areas. In the United States, in the UK, in Netherlands, we don't save enough. Right. It's like healthcare, we were talking about it earlier. In healthcare, most people know what good behaviors are. Many people don't live it. Right. I think most people, the same phenomenon, People know that they have to save, but they don't do it. And so but now they're they, hitting. Is it a function of not wanting to, or we don't learn about investing in school in this country? True. We it's, don't, the nomenclature is incredibly intimidating. You know, we so, don't call it a retirement account. We call it a 401k based yeah. upon a tax law. Melody, None I, of this is easy. Yeah, but I think the crisis really occurred when we changed, moved away from DB to DC. Do you think that was a bad thing? The outcome's horrible. I agree. Because I people do not invest so as well as the, the issue institutions. That, so, and I learned this in the UK from George Osborne, who at that time was the Chancellor yeah, of the Exchequer. George now is at BlackRock. George. George is now at BlackRock. He's great. We're not talking about your George, we're talking about. <laughs> now I know, I know George Osborne. <laughs> I like all Georges. Oh, good, oh, good. <laughs> uh, and he, you know, he, obviously he was anti-Brexit. They lost. He, he had a, he got booted. <clears throat> but he believes what they missed in the UK. He and David Cameron. And it was a, one of the epiphany meetings I ever had uh, about this issue. He said in the 1980s, when the UK economy was collapsing, jobs, millions of jobs were being lost. People left with a DB plan, but they lost their job. But they had hope and security with their DB. And he said, after the financial crisis in the UK, when millions of jobs were lost, <coughs> they left with a DC plan. And they had no clue how to navigate it, how to manage it. They didn't have the financial literacy. And he believes that created the anger and the uncertainty in the future that led to Brexit. <clears throat> and I think that's a, a, exactly the same situation here in the United States. So, for financial accounting purposes and liability purposes, corporations wanted to rid themselves of that responsibility. We created a defined contribution plan, and there's some really good defined contribution plans. I'm not trying to suggest they're all bad. But Originally we, intended to be supplemental, <clears throat> not the whole retirement solution. Correct. But what we have not done is educate people about the virtue of compounding, the virtue of long-termism. In, in, in fact, for the average individual saver, who should be outcome oriented for investing for that 40 year outcome called retirement, 50 year outcome called retirement. They don't understand that. And they don't understand that what's happening in the world today really doesn't matter. So how do we get them there? Well, unfortunately for that 50 year old, it's hard to get them anywhere. And they're just gonna have to work longer. And I think that's the anger that we have in this country today. It's that what happened? Here I am, 50 years old or 45 years old. I don't have enough in savings, which is one of the big problems we have in society. And now they're forced to work longer. But 50 today is not 50, 30 years ago. But we haven't educated people on the merits of longevity and the opportunity. And you know, as I said, we, the advancements in medicine and, and longevity has been fantastic. We, we have not made longevity a blessing 
We're making longevity a right. burden. Right. And so you're going to outlive your money. You're outliving your money. And so it's, I don't have a good solution for that 40 and 50 year old other than you're going to have to work longer. But gosh, if we don't create better financial literacy for that 20 year old and 25 year old, you know, we're not serving, awesome. we're not serving our country. We're not serving our community in which our purpose is supposed to be helping people have a, a, a bright financial future. Um, this is critical, and, this, and we are, this is why we're investing so much money in technology, right. and we're spending so much time. You know, we've, our, our technology platform now, we have the ability to provide that at the individual level, so we're trying to get more education. We're doing a lot more in robo-advising. Just, just, it's all about financial literacy. Hopefully, with greater financial literacy, uh, and, and also I do believe one of the issues that I believe is going to be impactful, let's be clear, we're, we, we've made immigration more difficult in this country. Really? Yeah, I'm not uh, shocked, huh? We made, is that good or bad? It's horrible. Well, I'm a globalist, so. So if immigration has been challenged. So uh, immigration has been challenged. We're, it, we're actually made it harder for our, our, even in the STEM areas for those young people to get a, to get a, to have a job here. We made it harder. We reduced the amount of work visas, you know, the, or the H-1B visas. Right. <clears throat> we have four-ish percent unemployment. We're making immigration harder. We're hard, making it harder for the, even the top college graduates, foreign nationals, to work here after we educate them. Um, so it is my view, and I've had conversations with even some Chicago companies today about this. It's harder to get the top talent today. And I believe that's going to lead towards a, a new conversation about retirement at, at the corporate level, too. People won't be, they'll be needed longer. Well, I actually believe, I was talking to one of the two tech companies about, and they're having a harder time differentiating. So I actually believe there's going to be a, a bigger dialogue in the future about how to create maybe a hybrid DB or a hybrid DC, whatever you want to call it, where you're going to have more engagement by the company. I actually believe we're going to, there's going to be a return of, because it's, at this low unemployment, it's not, it's, it's not working. We're having a harder time. And more importantly, we need to be retaining our people more. I mean, the, you know, you talk to the average company, how much turnover of people and how costly that is. And they're selling out of those plans when they leave the company. But I got to get to an issue. The volatility doesn't help. How do you feel about this current volatility? I think it's Long fun. overdue? Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> Great. Yeah. Because it creates opportunity. No, it, it, it creates realism. Okay, um, and realism is important. Look, at, if the market kept on running, I, I love the sugar high as much as anybody. It's fun, okay, it's great. You think you're geniuses. But it's not real. It's not real, and look, at, we only seen the vol in equity, and you saw a lot of bad behaviors perking up. You had a lot of hedge funds, a lot of uh, investors, shorting volatility to add income to their product. Right. And you had a spike in volatility and you had massive demand to sell equity assets as volatility spiked up. So you, un, you, know, you unravel those idiotic products that were created. Uh, some people were hurt by it, that's all good, but it reminds us that the markets are volatile um, and we're gonna have issues. We have not seen that spike in volatility in the bond market. Please, people I should understand. Many bond managers short volatility all the time as an income provider. You're gonna have the same problem in the bond market ultimately. But the key, what the market is saying is, for a, for a, we're the largest debtor nation in the world. 40% of our deficits are financed by other countries. The countries mostly that we're gonna have trade fights with now you generally don't yell at your bank when you borrow money, but you know, we're, you know, that's just not a good technique. Uh, we're doing a good job of that. Um, and, and, and so, we should be alarmed 
what's going on. Congress, in my mind, should not have had a budget that increased the deficit by $300 billion. Should the tax cut have happened? Well, I have many ways of saying there are many good parts of it and many bad parts of it. You know, my Republican friends, and I do have Republican friends, will say, if you, just like what President Obama said about health care, and we both could argue the pros and cons in both, but when you could get health care, you get it done. When you get a tax, corporate tax reform done, you get it done at any time. Was this an opportune time to do tax reform? Probably not, because it just is going to force the Federal Reserve to tighten faster. You know, Goldman Sachs came out today saying that the 10-year Treasury sometime this year will be at 3.5%. If 10 years, if 30 years, 75 basis points spread, four and a quarter, corporate spreads are five, five plus, we're going to get to the corporate bond market where it's going to be a threat to valuations in the equity market. But the, probably the most important thing that we are not calculating, we're going to have a $1.2 trillion deficit in fiscal year 2019, the biggest deficits we've ever had in good economic times. Um, historically, a $300 billion deficit would be an obscene deficit. That's how much they just increased it in this last budget. And so here we are at the same time the Federal Reserve is unwinding, is unwinding their $4 trillion balance sheet. We're, we're creating these record, record deficits. Um, and at the same time, we're shaking our trading partners who own close to $7 trillion of our debt, and are they going to continue to roll and own that? I mean, it's, it's going to lead us to, a, to, a, to probably higher interest rates faster, which is not good. So let me ask one last question. Yeah. We're out of time. Let's just pretend for the moment that you cannot walk into your office tomorrow. I'm not. Well, you're walking into another. <laughs> okay. Virtual office. Okay, you're going good. to okay. Minneapolis to see okay. a client. Yes. But you are doing the bidding of your company. Yes. Let's pretend that oh. tomorrow you could not do that. Okay. You're done there. I'm finished. What would you go and do? I, uh, I'm not frightened of that outcome. Um, I don't know. But there'll be a lot of opportunities. Um, so, uh, one thing I could say with absolute certainty um, my. My legacy is not about, it will not be about the moment, about the time I was leading the company. My legacy will be about how well the company does after me, not, not while I'm there. And so that is really important. And so I'm sticking around longer than I probably otherwise thought I was going to stick around to make sure that next generation is ready. And when I believe they're ready, I will be out. Um, and so I don't know. I, you know I, I never, I don't plan, I never planned what this outcome of what BlackRock is today. Um, I am absolutely excited about other opportunities. Um, and I know I have one more gig. So whatever that next gig is, I'll be, I'll be around. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Fink. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.